My name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Thank you for joining us today for another in our summer quarter Friday seminar series. Today's event is called The Challenges of Reimagining Policing, a Comparative Perspective. And with us today are Professors Beatrice Magaloni and Jeremy Weinstein. Dr. Magaloni is a professor of political science and a senior fellow at FSI and the founder and director of the Poverty, Violence and Governance Lab at FSI which looks to provide solutions to lawlessness and violence in comparative perspective. Uh, Jeremy, I can't call you Dr. Weinstein, and I really can't call uh, Beatrice Dr. Bagaloni, as it says in my notes. Professor Dr. Jeremy Weinstein is also a professor of political science and senior fellow here at FSI. Uh, like Beatrice, he has conducted extensive research on policing reforms and recently led a six country study of community policing experiments in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia. They'll start by talking about their research and evidence in a comparative perspective for some of the policy reforms currently under consideration both in the United States and throughout the world, and then we'll open it up for questions. To use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to, oh, I'm sorry, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. And before I hand it over to our co colleagues, I'd like to invite you to our last seminar of the summer series. It will be on Friday, August 7th. We'll pick up again in the fall when the, the fall quarter begins at Stanford. Uh, this session will offer a look at how U.S. national security intelligence flows to the president and other senior government officials. We'll have with us from FSI, Thomas Finger and Z Amy Ziegard to lead that discussion. Finally, for all of FSI's commentary and analysis, including recordings of these seminars, visit our website at fsi.stanford.edu. Thanks again for being here. And now I'll hand it over to Beatrice, who will speak first. Beatrice, the floor is yours. The microphone is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you, with Jeremy, and all of you uh, talking about such an important topic, especially for what is going on in the US today. So what we bring here is really a comparative perspective and hopefully some of our findings in other countries in, can inform some of the challenges that we see here. So I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to be presenting work on Brazil and Mexico that I've done over the course of the last eight years. and. Um, and I will begin just by a very, very short um, uh, introduction in terms of the police functions that I'm going to be covering. So police perform many functions. One of them relates to criminal invest to crime investigation. So they detain people, interrogate and prosecute people who are suspect of crime. But police also perform crime prevention functions like patrolling, receiving calls, responding to emergencies, chasing and confronting criminals, etc. In Latin America, which is the region of the world I focus, these functions are in a strange way have been assigned to two distinctive institutions. So for example, in Brazil, um, civil police are in charge of crime in investigation and military police are in crime in charge of um, of crime prevention. And in Mexico, we also have the distinction be between investigative police and preventing police. So that creates particular challenges. I'm not going to focus on those challenges, but I think it is a serious problem to have these institutions uh, reside in different places. Um, so I, I will be begin by talking about um, so some of my uh, work on the first aspect of police function, which is investigation. And this paper I, um, is going to be published in the American Political Science Review and it's on torture in Mexico uh, with uh, my student, Luis Rodriguez. Um, this, by the way, I mean, just very quickly, it's a mural painting in Mexico's Supreme Court. Um, after the transition to democracy, one of the um, Supreme Court justices, the, the one who was president, Gongora, as this artist to create this mural, which is amazing. In the entrance of the Supreme Court, you see a memory of all the torture and tragedies uh, performed by the police in the course of Mexico's history. What I'm going to be focusing is really not on political prosecutor, but uh, by police, but really on 
um, and the use of torture as a um, modus operandi operandum in criminal prosecutor, prosecu prosecution. So torture that is used in a systematic way in criminal trials in Mexico. And the question that motivates this part of the research is what restrains police brutality, illegal arrest, fabrication of evidence, coercion of witnesses, and the use of torture to extract confessions. Uh, Pinker in his very famous book on violence argues that the abolition of inhumane criminal punishments and torture to extract confessions is evidence of humankind's progress toward a more enlightened, humane, and peaceful order but we know little about how societies achieve this transition. I'm going to try to be fast. There is extensive literature on this that focuses on democracy, arguing that democracies are significantly better at restraining torture than autocracies. And what I'm going to be arguing here is that democracies, as we know now because of what is going on in the US, are also highly um, have challenges, serious challenges of restraining police abuse. So as we could see in the US with the Abu Ghraib um, um, soldier, uh, soldiers who torture uh, suspects and terrorists there, and also in Guantanamo Bay, torture has been used also in democracies like the US. In contrast to these cases, I'm studying torture that is performed in a systematic way by the by the by the um, by the police, um, and I focus on Mexico here. As I mentioned, the modus operandi of, of criminal prosecution has been the use of torture. In part, this derives from a total incapacity to investigate crimes, and the only way police in Mexico have been able to prosecute criminals is by violating due process. Courts in Mexico legitimize this behavior. And um, obviously the authoritarian regime was able to use this ample leeway that courts gave them to prosecute political enemies, to um, use torture in criminal trials, and also to prosecute um, social activists in this way. Um, but I want to also mention that, um, that the fact that they have so much legal allows them also to grant impunity to criminals. So more than 90% of the cases in Mexico go unresolved. Um, uh, the two explanatory variables that I'm going to be focused on here are criminal uh, procedures that shape uh, police behavior. And the second explanatory variable is the militarization of security. And I'm going to go fast here just to present the main insights of this work. Criminal procedures, Mexico as all over Latin America, retain inquisitorial criminal institutions that were established in, since colonial times. While Spain and Portugal reformed these institutions, uh, Latin America didn't do that until uh, well until 2000. Around eight of uh, Latin American countries finally abandoned these inquisitorial institutions and established what we call adversarial institutions that are um, with significantly stronger restrictions to what happens at the phase of investigation. Um, so there is now a judicial oversight to what police do and prosecutors do uh, in the moment that criminal suspects are being interrogated. And we're going to be studying in this paper the impact of that massive reform that uh, Mexico implemented, but all, their, all over Latin America, this reform has happened on torture. And then we also are going to explore how the militarization of security, which happened in Mexico um, because of the drug war starting in 2006, how much that militarization of security increased torture. So I'm going to go very fast. This is the dates of the reforms that were implemented in Mexico states. This is the type of turf wars that we observe in Mexico happening today. Criminal organizations, organized criminal groups fight, fighting each other for control of territory. So this, uh, the paper demonstrates that wherever you have a turf war, criminal uh, police use, more, uh, use torture more. Uh, so very, very fast I'm going to, um, um, tell you, this is the type of abuses that we obtain um, through uh, surveys by, uh, of prisoners in Mexico. So we have a survey that is um, collected all over prisons in Mexico that was collected by Mexico INEGI. 
uh, and we find that um, beatings, beatings with objects, crushed with heavy objects, suffocated or submerging water, electric shocks, burns, stab, um, threats of false char charges, harming family, um, prisoners held incommunicado, they are stripped, they are tied, they are blindfolded, and um, the reported abuses are between 50% of our, um, uh, 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 our, mm -hmm. our interviewees. Uh, all the way to 33%. So I'm going to just show you the tendencies. Uh, the first graph here shows the uh, average number of prisoners who report torture, then brute force, which is, um, which is um, uh, also very prevalent, and then threats to the family. And what basically we investigate in this paper is the impact of changing criminal, um, um, the reform. And we find huge uh, decreases in torture, fortunately, thanks to this massive investment in, 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 in reforming criminal prosecution. So I'm going to not going to go in detail to all the statistical testing, but this is, this is um, um, sort of the modeling strategy, which is a difference in difference approach. And we find dramatic reductions of torture thanks to the reform. And also we find very sharp increases in torture when, um, when uh, militarization of security uh, took place, which is the moment in which the armed forces were sent to the states to find criminal groups. So the basic conclusion is that thanks to the criminal reform, torture was restrained in Mexico. Police now face two, uh, very serious challenges because they don't know how to prosecute without violating human rights and it is imperative to develop investigative capacity in Mexico. So we have a very big challenge. So now I'm going to focus on another form of police violence, which is um, uh, police killings in Brazil. And I'm going to also try to go fast because I don't have much time. We basically study the implementation of a very important community-oriented policing approach in, in Rio de Janeiro, starting in 2008. The uh, government introduced this form of, uh, of policing in the favelas of Rio. Um, uh, the Olympics were going to take place and also the World Cup and Brazil didn't really want to, uh, to receive the world with the level of police violence that we see there. So Brazil is the most violent police in the world after Venezuela, just to give you a sense of how things are there. It, 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 the military police kill close to 20,000 people between 2003 and 2019. It's on average five people a day. Roughly 20% of all registered homicides are to take at the hands of the police. And the victims of this police violence are mostly black and pardos, which are people who are people of mixed uh, race who reside in marginalized communities um, and uh, that are, are called favelas in Rio. Um, so I'm going to show you the results of the introduction of the pacifying police units in 2007. We're interviewing with this community oriented approach. Uh, police were trained in human rights and problem-oriented policing principles, and the idea was to abandon the militaristic approach. This graph shows the number of police killings from 2004 to 2019, and the period that we study is 2008 until the present moment, so you can see a very sharp decline, almost of 60% of police killings in that period, and unfortunately, a very sharp increase after 2016. So I'm going to go very fast here, but what I'm going to argue is that the outcome of the police intervention really depending on two crucial things. One is the local, the type of criminal governance that existed in the favelas, and second, the uh, form of police behavior uh, that varied a lot across favelas. Um, so just to, uh, to summarize this very quickly, there are some spaces in, in Rio's favelas where criminal groups were quite effective at controlling local order and sanctioning common crime. And there are other places in, in, in the favelas where bandits and, and, and criminal rulers are extremely predatory. And what we find is that in places where the bandits were able to control local order, police created a disaster. The presence of the police increased crime and, and it was really not a very good um, uh, intervention from the perspective of favela residents. But in places where the bandits were really aggressive towards the community and were not able to control the violence, we find very strong uh, results that the police, uh, uh, community-oriented policing approach 
um, work well. So I'm not going to focus on all these data that we, data collection effort that we did, but we were able to match favelas that were not um, uh, intervene with favelas that were intervened, and also we were able to code the, crim the local criminal order in each of these favelas, which was a massive data collection effort. And we find really this uh, very strong support in terms of uh, here you should you for uh, homicides, police killings, and in general lethal violence. And as our theory predicts, in places where the bandits, so we call it insurgent, these are places where bandits are very effective at controlling order, but they are very confrontational with the state. This approach introduced a form of local war. Whereas in other areas where you have more anarchic criminal rule, more predatory criminal rule, the, the, the police in oriented approach was really effective. And finally, we also have surveys of the community and we find very strong evidence that police abuse. So there were a lot of instances of police violence by these supposedly better trained police officers that those forms of police abuse created um, a, a very strong resistance on the part of the community for this form of community oriented approach. So the conclusion is that the outcomes of police interventions are very contextual. They are jointly determined by the form of police behavior that takes place on the ground and by the criminal government uh, governance context. Paradoxically, the presence of police induces, induces increases in crime and social disorder where criminal rulers were able to maintain order. But in other areas where there was ample social disorder and criminal rule was predatory, um, people were better off with the presence of the police. But there is a huge principal agent dilemma, um, which is how to restrain police abuse. And so clear, quickly, quickly, I'm going to present the results of a large randomized evaluation where we introduce cameras, body-worn cameras in one of these favelas. And I won't have time to unfortunately present all the incredibly interesting, very contextual data on how these security deprived communities live uh, and also how police behave in terms of use of, for, what, use of force and well, what are the patrolling activities, how much, for example, the community um, um, is very aggressive towards the police itself. So here we have, for example, percentage of police officers who report that the community throws water to them, throws urine, uh, throws stones, uses verbal threats or even physical attacks. So police live in a really very dangerous setting where community do, don't, uh, doesn't accept them. Anyway, so we introduced uh, uh, randomly cameras for over a year. Uh, we had more than 9,000 shifts of police um, uh, um, using cameras in a random way. And we used two dependent variables. So how much police stop and search people, how much police respond to calls and how much police in general um, um, uh, encounter people in the streets and how much police use force. And so just to give you a sense of how much force we're talking about prior to the study, 70 people were injured, 10 people were killed in this setting. Uh, police use an average of 300, um, 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 20, 30 guns every, uh, gunshots every time they use their guns. And in the time that of, our, of our study, which it says here starts of the study, fortunately no one was killed and there was a sharp reduction in use of force. So I'm not going to show you in detail, but we find more or less 40% reduction in, in the use of force with the cameras and 60% reduction in stop and searches. But unfortunately, we also find massive reduction of all forms of policing activities. Police even stop um, answering calls from civilians when using the cameras. Um, even though we have this huge depolicing, we don't find effects uh, that crime increase because of the cameras. So that's a good result for us. But we have a paradox in our study that police, even though the cameras induce such large change of behavior on the part of the police, they refused to use the cameras. They didn't really want to use the cameras. At the end of the study, only 10% of the officers were turning the cameras <coughs> for less than one minute every time that they turned them on. So I, we demonstrate um, why police refused to turn the cameras on. And in general, the bad news is that officers who use more force, who have been wounded in the past or who 
who are wounding someone or have wounded someone in the past, or they themselves have been wounded, use less the cameras. But we also find that the more the community is aggressive towards them, the more they turn on the camera. So the conclusion, and let me just wrap up. When we started the study, the police commander told us, if you put cameras to my officers, they would stop doing their job. And I think this, this phrase is incredibly telling of the results of our studies. As we mentioned, cameras induce sharp reductions in use of force and abusive encounters. But they also induce a, a very sharp depolicing, um, even uh, officers refusing to answer in the calls. And so the, the, re the real question is why, what do officers in Rio believe their jobs is? And we asked them this in a survey, 70% of them told us that their job was to fight drug traffickers. Only 10% told us that it was to bring peace in the community. And I don't recall what was the third, uh, the third option there. Um, so what we observe here is what police regularly do in their jobs. They know that it cannot be recorded without seriously compromising them. So the study shows that they simply did not record most of the interactions, but just having the camera on induced them to, to, to engage in significantly less force. So, so basically I don't think that cameras can be the solution uh, to police violence. And as I hopefully with uh, Jeremy's comments, we'll come back to this. We really need to conceive of more broad and general reforms that are really uh, not these piecemeal uh, approaches, but obviously introducing better monitoring and sanctioning of police officers is essential. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that I didn't really invade you with too much information, but I'm very happy to come back to to some of these issues in the question and answer. Okay. Great, thank you, Beatrice. Let me just share my screen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be sharing the stage with Beatrice, who has a much longer history of working on these issues than I do. Um, but I'm really happy to share the results of some work that I've done as part of the Evidence and Governance and Politics Network uh, through an initiative called the Medaketa Initiative. Before I get started, I just wanna say that our conversation today, as well as the work in the Medaketa, is really motivated by, uh, I think, two ideas that justify a sort of focus on the global perspective. One is that issues of mistrust between police agencies and citizens are obviously hugely salient in the United States but they're also salient all around the world and that policing creates extraordinary challenges of how to preserve law and order, but also manage and restrain abuse and avoid racialized patterns of policing or discriminatory patterns of policing. Uh, and that's not just a challenge in the United States, it's a challenge in many different countries. And likewise, as you look across Beatrice's studies or the study that I'm gonna share with you today, there are a whole set of reforms, whether it's reforms to uh, criminal procedure or institutional rules, reforms related to the introduction of new technologies or new policing practices that are out there in debates today about the United States, but also debates in Brazil and South Africa in India and other contexts. And what we're hoping to offer you today is a perspective on what the evidence has to say about the efficacy of many of these kinds of reforms when delivered in a real world context. So I'm gonna talk about Medicata 4. And just to give you some context for what a Medicata is, this is work done by a network called Evidence and Governance and Politics. It's a group of researchers and practitioners who come together with a focus on well-identified experimental research designed to produce rigorous evidence on particular policy interventions that are of the highest priority for practitioners who are working on the politics of global development, uh, or institutional change and governance in developing countries. A Medicata, and what distinguishes a Medicata from any individual study, is it's designed to facilitate the accumulation of knowledge. And so what I mean by that is the goal is to organize a set of comparable studies that are implemented in similar ways with harmonized outcome measures across multiple contexts. And the virtue of doing something in that way enables you to understand 
the empirical results for the test of a given hypothesis, uh, and how that hypothesis plays out across a diversity of contexts. And typically the challenge of accumulating knowledge in the social sciences is that every study is different in too many ways to facilitate our ability to draw inferences across multiple studies. And so here, the only thing that varies across studies is the context, but the interventions themselves and the outcome measures, those are controlled. The way we build out metaketas, and this is the fourth metaketa, is we issue an RFP with a specific policy problem detailed. We invite research teams to respond. We select an excellent group of research teams, and then we design an intervention in common. In this case, we've done a set of six coordinated studies on community policing. Uh, this was led by three steering committee members and then six research teams with 20 individual researchers working in six different countries, Colombia, Brazil, Liberia, Uganda, Pakistan, and the Philippines. And in each case, the research team was partnered with a police agency in the country to design and implement a community policing intervention. Now, what was the policy problem that motivated our Medicata? Of course, what is at the center of our minds is the fact that all around the world, people live in conditions of insecurity and experience the risk of violence that is totally unrelated to war. Much of our work traditionally focuses on war and how to prevent war and how to respond to war. But for many people around the world, whether as a function of violence within the household or interpersonal violence in their communities or violence related to organized crime, uh, people live in conditions of tremendous insecurity. And sometimes, of course, that's driven by the behavior of criminal gangs or individuals who commit criminal acts. But in many contexts, it's also driven by the behavior of the police who victimize citizens physically and sometimes financially as well. As I mentioned at the outset, this is a global issue. So one of our partners produced data that was then reproduced uh, in, in The Economist, just demonstrating the significance of homicide in a whole variety of different regions in the world, but also that it's particularly an urban phenomenon that's been associated with the agglomeration of large numbers of people in urban areas. And so typically the crime rates and the homicide rates tend to be highest in major cities. That's true also in the United States. But it's also a global policy priority. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals were negotiated in 2015. And for the first time, one of the global goals for development was focused on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies with a whole set of targets around crime reduction and fair and equal treatment by police services and access to justice. And so ultimately that's what motivated us as a network to think about what kind of coordinated knowledge building we could do with respect to policing. Now, when one thinks of strategies to reduce crime, people typically have in the back of their mind a canonical model of crime that dates back to Becker and other microeconomic theorists of crime, where if you wanna reduce crime in a community, you think about increasing the costs of committing a crime, perhaps by increasing the risk of arrest or sanctioning, or finding ways of decreasing the comparative benefits of crime, perhaps by providing more productive or enjoyable opportunities for people who might otherwise choose to participate in crime. But when you think about this canonical model, you have to lift up to the fore the role of police. Because one answer to the challenge of insecurity ultimately begins with the creation of a professional, uniformed, and regulated police force. But as we're seeing with protests in the United States, as well as the protests that have echoed what's happened in the United States around the world, modern policing brings with it its own set of problems, some of which Beatrice spoke to related to Mexico and Brazil in particular. High levels of mistrust between the police and citizens, abuses including torture and killing, and also in many developing countries, a lack of independence of the police from politics, which is a distinct issue, but one that really affects the efficacy of police services in many developing countries. Now, bringing the global dissatisfaction into the context of some of the countries in which we were working for our Medicata, here's just a simple graphic describing from surveys that we did of households across these countries, 
levels of satisfaction that people have with services provided by the police. What you have in the blue bar is the level of average level of satisfaction in the most advanced economies in the world, the OECD countries. And then you can see for a set of other countries that we were working in, Brazil, the Philippines, Uganda, Liberia, and Pakistan, significantly lower levels of satisfaction in police services. So what are the impediments to effective policing in the global south, the set of countries in which we were operating to think about police reform? And what I'd underscore for you is like one model that you can have in the back of your mind is to think that these issues of mistrust between the police and citizens uh, have a set of underlying causes. For example, number one, the lack of autonomy that police have from political actors. So if you think about Uganda, where the Ugandan police force has often been used and deployed by President Museveni as part of campaigns of electoral harassment and intimidation, for opposition activists, that lack of autonomy really undermines the trust that citizens have in police as an independent and neutral arbiter to preserve the rule of law. In a number of countries, you also have issues of insufficient capacity. So whereas in the United States, we think of police forces often as overly militarized with advanced weapons, really high quality vehicles and radio networks, in many of the countries in which we're operating, take a place like Liberia, police officers don't have access to a weapon, they don't have access to a computer, they don't have access to a motorbike or a car, they don't have access to a radio. So many of these environments have tremendously low capacity. And of course, this also undermines the confidence that citizens might have in the ability of police and the willingness of police uh, to deter crime or to in investigate crimes uh, once they've been committed. And then finally, as Beatrice pointed to, there are also principal agent issues that afflict police agencies. Issues where police leadership may provide an order that say uh, uh, excessive force should not be used and those orders are ignored by patrol officers on the beat. Or for example, police agencies may say it's against the law to take a bribe in order to incentivize uh, or in order to, to, in exchange for you carrying out an investigation of a case, um, yet police officers do that nonetheless. These are three deep and underlying factors that get in the way of police agencies being in a position to build a trusting cycle of interaction with citizens where citizens turn to the police when they face crime, when they share tips with police because they're fearing that someone in their neighborhood is involved in a gang or may have committed a crime, yet that trust between police and citizens is so fundamental to the effective operations of the police. And so as we approached how to examine this question in the context of the countries in which we're operating, we had that background model of the impediments to effective policing in mind, and we focused in particular on one approach to police reform the approach called community policing that really has its origins in the United States and in the UK. And what community policing is, for those who aren't familiar with it, is it's an approach to policing that directly engages citizens in the policing process. And it accomplishes this by creating opportunities for police and citizens to engage in dialogue and creating mechanisms that facilitate more active collaboration between citizens and the police. When you look across community policing models in different parts of the world, what you'll see are a set of common elements. Increased police presence on the ground. So instead of the police only showing up when a crime has been committed, you'll see the police actively walking the beat in different neighborhoods or decentralizing the location of their offices so that they're visible and accessible to people in the community. You see lots of community engagement programs town halls, for example, or community meetings and focus groups, where the orientation of the police is to create opportunities for people to provide input and feedback, to share information, and to describe uh, what role they would like to see the police play. And then you also see things like problem-oriented policing, where police agencies are trying to create a much tighter connection between the feedback provided by citizens, that is, this particular area of the community needs a more intensive focus and then trying to align resources behind that more intensive focus so that engagement isn't something that just generates ideas 
without follow through. Now, why might we think community policing is something that's worth exploring around the world? Because we did a systematic review of existing experiments of community policing, focusing in particular on those research studies that have credible inferential designs that give us confidence in the efficacy of this particular model of policing. And when you look across the best studies that have been done on this topic, you get mixed results. Sometimes there's null effects, Sometimes there's negative effects on crime, but our conclusion from our systematic review is that overall the weight of the evidence suggests that community policing is a relatively efficacious strategy. It's something that has been systemic, systematically associated with the reduction in crime. But the way that most of these studies are designed, there's no evidence of whether the mechanism by which crime is reduced is an improvement in police citizen relations, a reduction in the abusiveness of police or the misconduct of police or greater trust between police and citizens. So we see these kinds of correlations in the data. There seems to be some systematic evidence that they exist. These studies have only been carried out in three countries, the US, the UK, and Australia. And we saw this as an opportunity to put this hypothesis to a broader test. So the overall research question that motivated our Medicaid is does community policing improve security and change citizen perceptions of the police? And across the six contexts in which we did this work, we designed a common treatment where we partnered with the local agency to implement locally appropriate community engagement and problem-oriented policing programs. And key to a Medicaid, as I said at the outset, is not just a common treatment, but also common outcome measures. That is across our six research teams, we agreed on how we would measure security, citizen perceptions of the police, police perceptions of citizens and their behavior, and behavioral measures of cooperation with the police. And we designed these measures in common and then rolled out household surveys of citizens, surveys of police agencies, as well as gathered administrative data on crime so that we could test this hypothesis in a common way with a common empirical strategy on a common treatment. As I mentioned again at the beginning, we had six different studies included, Brazil, Liberia, the Philippines, Colombia, Pakistan, and Uganda. In each case, we were engaged with a major police agency in designing the intervention. The results I'm presenting to you today only include five of the sites. We've not yet finished an analysis of the Brazil data. Uh, and hopefully we'll have those updated results soon. When you look across the different agencies, what community policing meant in practice varied, but it varied only slightly. That is, each police agency was taking the theory of community policing and figuring out what was the incremental change that they could bring to their own practices that would demonstrate get greater dedication to community engagement and problem-oriented policing. And in some contexts, that meant much greater foot patrols. In other places, it was a focus on town hall meetings. In some contexts, it involved really amping up citizen feedback mechanisms. In other contexts, it involved bringing to the table citizen watch forums that would provide input uh, and information to police agencies. So we think of this as a package of community policing that moved in common across our sites but designed in ways that was locally appropriate uh, for each context. How do we investigate the results? Well, we construct these standardized outcome measures for the main outcomes to ensure comparability. Then we produce estimates of the treatment effect of community policing on these different outcomes, context by context. And then finally, we pool the results across all six studies in what's called a meta-analysis which enables us to test the grand hypothesis of looking across these diverse contexts, can we say that community policing is an effective intervention? The good news on the results is first, that the intervention was faithfully implemented, right? So one of the challenges that Beatrice described with respect to body-worn cameras is the challenge that Maybe police don't even use the body-worn cameras. Maybe they turn them off, and we've heard about that in context in the United States as well. And so our first exercise analytically was to make sure that across all the study sites, there is evidence of greater presence of police. There is evidence that citizens are more likely to encounter 
the police and community meetings. There's evidence that citizens are engaged in citizen watch groups and the like. And we see consistently across our study sites in the bottom half of the graph, and then at the top of the graph in the overall meta-analysis, strong evidence of compliance uh, across our community policing interventions. But the results look quite different when you look at the effects on victimization, the effects on trust, the effect of percept on perceptions of the police or on police abuse, on crime tips, citizen collaboration, and the like, which is what we find is a consistent null effect. In the meta-analysis, but also in all six sites, there is no evidence that a community policing intervention of the form that we mounted led to a reduction in crime or an increase in trust between citizens and the police. As I said, this is not just a function of some cases where it didn't work and in other cases it did, but a consistent result across all six sites precisely estimated a null effect on these outcomes. And so where I wanna end before we open it up to Q&A is how do we interpret these results? Community policing is something that was found to be effective in a number of contexts in the United States and the UK. It made sense to think about it given the issues of police and citizen mistrust in many developing countries. And so we rolled it out at scale in a really large multi-site randomized controlled trial. So in trying to make sense of the null results, we start with some things uh, that are basic checks on our design. So number one, is it the case that we found that community policing isn't effective because we simply tried to implement community policing in really hard cases, like Liberia, for example, where the police have very limited capacity? But what we'd argue based on these results is that this isn't simply a function of hard cases because Brazil and Colombia are two of the most capable police agencies in the developing world with significantly larger budgets on a per capita basis and police presence and resources available. These are contexts that vary in terms of the level of crime and victimization, in terms of the level of capacity in government, and we still see null results across six sites. You, could, you might also ask, well, are the null results a function of the fact that our version of community policing is weak, that it's a weak treatment compared to how community policing has been deployed in other contexts? And as we outline in the paper, we don't think the evidence is strong for this interpretation either. Our community policing intervention in many cases lasted far longer than the community policing interventions that were tried in developed country contexts. And it's also not the case that our research experiments were designed with insufficient statistical power to detect small effects. In fact, we are powered to detect very small effects yet we still find a precisely estimated null effect. And so the bottom line from a more qualitative investigation of what unfolded in our six sites is that these community policing interventions really did change practice, but they were insufficient to move the needle on outcomes because of the deeper issues that afflict so many of the police departments on which we focused. The lack of autonomy from politics that undermines trust, the weak capacity of most of these police agencies to follow through on the issues raised by citizens, and principal agent issues that speak to the lack of effective oversight and accountability, which creates context in which bribery and abuse flourish. The bottom line, and a bottom line that I think is relevant to the debates that we're having in the United States, and it also follows from Beatrice's comment about uh, the use of body-worn cam cameras, is that incremental reforms will not and cannot be effective in the absence of the kind of systemic change that is to the design of police forces that really create the conditions for legitimate, transparent, and fair administration of the rule of law. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you both, that was fantastic. Uh, lots of data, lots of comparisons. We will make sure just for the, those that are still with us, all 300 of you, that we will post relevant publications uh, at the FSI website at the end of this seminar so you can dig deeper into this. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom. We already have two dozen of them and we don't have much time, so I'm gonna group them. Um, and Beatrice and, and Jeremy, there were many questions, just as you would predict, asking to press you further uh, to uh, um, 
uh, help us understand how your research might improve police reform in the United States. Some people are saying, well, this is apples and oranges. We're a different system. Others are pressing you to talk a little bit about more how com community police reform has worked in the United States or not, the historical uh, uh, literature that you both referenced. Uh, there's a third set of questions about um, the debate summer we've been having in the United States about having the police just uh, address certain kinds of questions of security and not address other kinds of security, disaggregating that. And there's one question that asks very uh, bluntly, uh, this was particularly to you, Beatrice, what does your research mean for the, what Trump is doing in Portland versus what uh, might happen if he tries to do the same in Chicago? Uh, given that those communities might have different environments in terms of the, the, the police, I'm going to forget exactly the word, but the environment uh, of, of various organized crime groups that might be in those two places. So the, the broad sweep here question is, how, you know, if you're pressed harder, what does this research tell you about what you might suggest for police reform in the United States? And why don't we start with Beatrice first and then Jeremy. Well, my, this is a very challenging question, I think. Uh, so I, I, I want to tell you, I, I've been working on, on this topic for close to 10 years and really on the ground, closely with the officers, especially in Brazil, and then very closely with communities who are victimized both, both by police and by criminals. And I've gone through a period in which I was very hopeful of this reform. Um, the community, it's a form of community oriented policing, what I mean, maybe didn't really clarify that. The UPP that I studied in Brazil, in which officers were present, in which uh, they were really trying to develop close relationship with, uh, with the residents in the favelas, as opposed to what used to happen before, that it was just armed invasions literally invasions by the military police. And um, so we have a lot of narratives in which police are really um, building very close relationships with women, taking them to health clinics when they are delivering their babies, uh, having community meetings. And so, so I went from a really hopeful perspective and then started to see how this began to deteriorate in some areas where two things happen. One is corruption by police officers, as I think Frank mentioned in one of his comments. Yes, there's lots of questions about that. Well, yeah. He started to ask for extortion. So people wanted to have, for example, a party in the favelas. They had to give money to the police so that they were allowed. Or questions like torturing people, killing people, killing innocent residents, you know, people, uh, residents dying in the crossfire and so on. So I think that overall what that part of my research and it's a little bit sort of very complex to present in so little time but it does show that that heterogeneity of outcomes is very important for us to better understand what happens so as i mentioned in if you just take the look at oh this is so bad then you become a little bit of an anarchist and say better let communities resolve their own problems because this is such a really rotten institution you never are going to get it right so let's get rid of the police uh, which is what some communities were telling us they said they, they i have just the number here 47 said police is percent more violent than the criminals 20 uh, 20 so 40 uh, it says when asked whether residents consider police more violent than criminal groups uh, against the community, 47 agree and 20 disagree. So wow. in this setting, people are saying we prefer the criminals. We used to, the, the, a woman I remember we interviewed when this uh, reform started, she said, we poor people have a way of resolving our conflicts. Why the hell the state is coming here? So you can take that perspective, but then you go to another community where I mentioned the criminal groups are predatory and really brutalize citizens. And the, in those areas, they were really thankful that these police arrived. So I think that our, our paper really provides that uh, picture of the things are really complex and there is no one solution for everyone. 
So I think that also makes it very challenging because understanding security and how to design this requires a lot of underground work. So that would be uh, something that I, I think this informs what happens in the US. In some areas, I think when we are talking about defund the police, get rid of, in some areas, I think it would be feasible to have very reduced police presence and other type of institutions engaging with the community. And I think that would be extremely relevant. But in other areas where you have heavily armed groups, gangs fighting each other, a lot of homicides, I find it very hard to, to, to understand how the community is going to solve that without any presence of force. And, and that's, I think, something we need to keep in mind. So that, that would be my response. Mm -hmm. Great. Jeremy? So I'm, I'm newer to this field than, than Beatrice. And uh, you know, though these issues are highly salient at the current moment, we launched our study, studies almost three years ago. Um, and so uh, it's nice that the results are coming out now, but they obviously weren't designed to inform exactly the conversations that are happening at this moment. But I'll share with you some reflections about what I feel uh, I've learned about policing. Um, so point number one is that we have to grapple with the fundamental power imbalance that is at the core of policing, right? That is a set of citizens who are wanting to live peacefully, um, a formalized police agency uh, that has access to weapons and the legitimate right to use force against citizens, an imbalance in power between those two actors, and in the context of increasing crime or in many developing countries, um, a lack of autonomy uh, from the police, that adversarial relationship, which in the US has been militarized, really undermines any sense of trust or confidence in these agencies. And if you grapple with policing through that lens, recognizing this profound lack of trust as a questioning of the motives of police agencies, a question of whether they are really on board with what is their express public purpose uh, versus acting in opposition to your own interests as a citizen, you begin to understand why interventions like community policing, which is what we studied, which are simply designed to facilitate greater dialogue and engagement between citizens and the police, are unlikely to actually address the core issues of mistrust that exist in these societies. That is things, for example, I think as one of Frank's comments suggested, you have more interaction with the police, you could end up with more abuse and more bribery, right? Even though I think the proponents of community policing have often thought that we can take the police department's commitment to do a good job and to treat people well for granted. And this is about providing information and creating mechanisms for collaboration and more effectively allocating services. So that's why I call community policing an incremental on the margins intervention, like a technological intervention like body worn cameras that doesn't really get to the issues of the moment. So what does get to the issues of the moment? Well, four things that I'd highlight. Number one, some clear choices that we need to make about the mission of the police. And David Skolansky's question in the, in the Q and A box spoke to this, which is, you know, to what extent do we think that uh, police agencies should be responsible for much of the social service provision that they end up doing. That is when someone encounters someone who is mentally ill or drug addicted and needs treatment, should their first interaction be with a police officer or should it be with someone else, with the police officer remaining in the car and a social worker being the first person to interact with them. We have not clarified those lines of responsibility and it puts uh, people at risk in a way that may be unnecessary. And that that is also true in developing countries because even though police have less capacity, they're still often the most present of any government agency in any particular community. The second is that you need really effective mechanisms of oversight and accountability. And I think in the United States, we're discovering the limits of our mechanisms of oversight and accountability. Some of that has to do with the power of police unions and the way in which police agencies are organized to protect their own members. Uh, but ultimately, the kinds of limits uh, on, on, on police abuse and bribery and other things that we saw uh, lacking in developing countries are also lacking in the United States. 
The third is that police need the capacity to do their job, but not necessarily the capacity to do more than their job. And so the militarization that we've seen of the police in the United States uh, has perhaps produced a situation in which we've created much greater divisions between the police and citizens in contrast to say police officers who remain unarmed in many parts of the UK and who have to establish a very different dynamic with citizens. And then the issue that's probably not relevant to the United States, maybe except for the moment that we're in with respect to Portland, uh, is to preserve the separation between policing and politics. Uh, and I think generally in the United States, we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, the deployment of federal agents in Portland looks far more like the dynamics that you would see in a Uganda uh, or a Liberia than anything we've seen in the US in recent memory. Um, but I think preserving the independence of police from politics and political interests is key. And those are all what I call systemic reforms that require radical re-envisioning of the rules and structures and funding not the incremental interventions that you'll hear lots of people advocating about getting police and citizens to talk to one another. So fantastic answers to you both. We are already out of time and we have some really terrific questions in the Q&A box. I'll, we'll aggregate them and maybe we can get you guys to answer them um, uh, online in some way. Maybe to end though, there, there's lots of focus on uh, translation, lots of uh, questions about systemic change. And Jeremy, you just answered that. So let me try to aggregate a bunch of questions and lots on corruption, which you also both tackled. So uh, thank you for doing that. Um, but there are some people wanting some answers about incremental change as well. We have a set of questions on systemic and incremental. So here's my quick question, realizing we have 60 seconds left for both of you. Um, if you had the chance to brief the new president of the United States, let's for the purposes of counterfactuals and hypotheticals say we would have a new president, uh, and you got five minutes to brief a new president of the United States, um, what would be the one message you would say that they should focus on uh, about police reform in the United States? And secondly, and this doesn't have to be such a counterfactual because he's just right down the road, what if you got 10 minutes to go brief the mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, Stanford graduate, and you could tell them just one thing to do differently. What would be your answers to both of those individuals? Uh, Jeremy, let's start with you and then we'll give Beatrice the last word. No, you're supposed to send that one to Beatrice, that really hard <laughs> question. Um, so, Big or small? So, so I think the answer is recognizing that a lot of the problems that we face with respect to crime are a function of far more deeply rooted social challenges uh, that include lack of opportunity, that include the organization of gangs and other things that provide opportunities and identity to people, alcoholism and drug abuse, mental health, and that as opposed to the path that we've taken to militarize and create more adversarial relationships between police and the citizens they serve, that we need a more multifaceted interaction approach in the community that doesn't always have the police in the lead, uh, but that recognizes the primary role of police officers in maintaining security and, and has a far more interlinked network of services to deploy in response to, you know, threats to, or what are perceived as threats to safety. Fantastic. Beatrice, you get the last word. I think what Jeremy mentioned is extremely important, and that's where where the word reimagining policing, I think, is about. And I think that as our friends in the police in Brazil would tell us, we are in Rosinha doing this randomized evaluation on cameras, and, and they turn and say, you know, there is no presence of the state anywhere here. So there is no schools, there is no universities, there is no health. The only institution that you see here is the police. And they wow. would say, well, we also get all the blame. And, and I, I actually sympathize with that vision because Brazil, Brazil state has never fully committed to that huge sector of society who are poor living in these marginalized uh, communities. So I think that what Jeremy mentioned is very important not only in the US, but everywhere. So one big uh, takeaway. The other is militarization of policing is 
really the worst um, principle that's I didn't have time to show how much that impacted torture in Mexico, but it's huge. When the government decided we are going to send the army to you know fight criminal groups, we see huge increases in abuse. The same thing in Brazil. So I would say what Trump is doing is the opposite that we need to be doing. And the third point that I, that I think it's essential is to be able to sanction officers for misconduct. Uh, so that's, I think, the problem with cameras. One thing is to have just recording, but the other, the next step is really to be able to sanction and suspend officers. So I think we, you know, finally are seeing some, you know, movement in that direction. When officers get that message, they are going to forcefully have to change behavior. Wow, fantastic answers, both of you. Thank you so much, both for the detailed presentations. Uh, to me for making the case for why comparative research uh, is useful, especially even for understanding our own country here in the United States. Thanks again for coming uh, and see you in a couple of weeks for our next uh, FSI seminar series. Thanks so much. Thank Mike. you guys. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.